uh, Western Mining Action Network. I'm the network coordinator. And I want to uh, welcome everybody to today's webinar and thank you for, for joining us. Um, I wanted to take just a couple minutes for some brief housekeeping. Uh, I would ask that those of you who have called in on the phone, if you would kindly uh, mute yourselves during the presentation, that would be really helpful. We're going to have close to 50 people on the phone today, so um, please do keep yourself muted until the question and uh, answer section. This is going to be a relatively short presentation, about 10 minutes or so, so there will be lots of opportunities for you to ask uh, questions. I'd like to take a minute uh, to introduce our presenter. Uh, Dr. David Chambers is the founder and president of the Center for Science and Public Participation, which is a nonprofit corporation that provides technical assistance on mining and water quality issues. A lot of folks on this line I know have, um, have uh, used Dave's expertise in their, in their issues. Uh, Dr. Chambers has 40 years of experience in mineral exploration and development. 15 years of that is technical and management experience in the mineral exploration industry. And for the past 25 years, he has served as an advisor on the environmental effects of mining projects, both nationally and internationally. He has an engineering degree in physics from the Colorado School of Mines a Master of Science degree in Engineering from the University of California at Berkeley, and he's a registered professional geophysicist in California. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dave, for, for presenting today, and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. All right. Thank you, Mary, and uh, welcome, everyone. I would imagine if your conditions are like, most of, uh, like ours, it's a very warm uh, morning for you. What I'd like to do today is, is to talk essentially about dry closures, which was one of the primary recommendations that came out of the Mount Pauly expert panel review, and, um, and how that relates to the issue of perpetual water treatment and tailing storage fa facility failure, uh, perpetual water treatment being one of the uh, major concerns of uh, communities uh, throughout the world and that it, it potentially places a uh, long-term financial obligation uh, and or environmental obligation on the public um, if that's not properly dealt with by the by the mine and of course uh, since uh, we're talking about a perpetual obligation uh, that, that's something we don't have a lot of experience with. So first of all, let's talk about risks and what are the risks of a tailing storage facility failure and in trying to think about that categorically, it, I came up with three major ones. One, of course, uh, is the potential loss of life and property due to a tailings dam failure. Uh, there would also be some sort of environmental degre degradation, uh, which often is permanent to some extent. And then, of course, uh, today in, in the world, there's no uh, governmental requirement to have a financial compensation for a tailings, a catastrophic tailings failure. So there would be no compensation and potentially no environmental mitigation for the losses incurred. And a good example of that, of course, is the Mount Polly. Uh, tailings dam failure where uh, there was environmental degradation and thankfully no loss and, and that's just uh, a very uh, good quirk of fate in this case because there could have been uh, loss of life involved. Uh, property damage was minimal but there's ongoing environmental degradation. Uh, most of the tailings are in uh, sitting in the lake, in Quinell Lake, so uh, that hasn't been mitigated. 
and the communities themselves that were impacted in terms of uh, financial losses for business, uh, in terms of uh, social losses, uh, mainly say to uh, tribal interests, none of that has really been compensated to any extent. So um, if we're going to have uh, dry closures, uh, one of the issues associated with dry closures is perpetual water treatment because you're going to have some seepage associated with any sort of dry closure approach you might want to come up with. And what are the risks associated with perpetual water treatment? And again, in trying to categorize them, I come up with two. One is the public may need to, uh, at some point, pick up all or part of the cost of water treatment. And there's going to be some sort of uh, environmental degradation associated with uh, a loss of uh, treatment. Uh, that is, the treatment may not work, or degraded water may result if there if the treatment has to stop if it can't be paid for. So those uh, those are the risks of uh, associated with perpetual water treatment. So where do uh, where does perpetual water treatment and dry closure conflict? Um, wet wet tailings closures can do away with the need for perpetual water treatment, at least on uh, the uh, industrial type treatment. There may be some passive treatment associated with a wet closure. But but with a wet closure, you also have the highest risk of a catastrophic tailings failure. So we're essentially looking, when we talk about dry closures, of either having the risk uh, with a wet closure of a cat catastrophic tailings failure like Mount Polly or like Fundau in Brazil, or the risk of perpetual water treatment and, and, and a failure there, which means uh, a potential financial and environmental degradation um, associated with perpetual water treatment. Now, I'd like to go to the uh, findings of the Mount Polly expert panel, which was a three-person panel convened by British Columbia after the Mount Polly failure. These uh, were all acknowledged uh, tailings dam experts, uh, Professor Mortensen from the uh, um, um, from Alberta, from the from, I believe it was the University of Alberta, who is a very well published uh, dam expert, uh, not necessarily tailings dams. And then Stephen Vick, uh, who has sort of written the Bible on tailings dam design and uh, been a design engineer in the industry for 35 to 40 years. And then uh, Professor Dirk Van Zeel from the University of British Columbia, and probably, in my estimation, the the most industry connected of all those uh, all those people, and they came up with some uh, actually very strong recommendations, in my opinion, for for people with uh, primarily academic and industry backgrounds. Uh, First of all, they said safety needs to be the primary consideration. And quite frankly, today, the primary consideration in tailings dam design is cost. So we need to make a fundamental shift from uh, cost being the primary consideration to safety being the primary consideration. And then they said, uh, Alternatives to water cover should be aggressively pursued. And uh, in that same light, they also said that they recognize that creating dry tailings 
may increase the amount of water requiring treatment or storage, uh, essentially getting at the issue that I'm talking about today, which is perpetual water treatment versus dry tailings. Now, um, British Columbia is the only regulatory environment that's actively resp responded to the Mount Polly tailings failure. And when they did so, uh, they did not emphasize safety. They made safety a consideration, but they didn't give it any preference uh, over cost. And uh, while they said wet closures, alternatives to wet closures need to be considered, again, they didn't make that a primary consideration and they um, fudged by saying that each site uh, needs to be considered individually. Um, and in fact, uh, every mine that's been proposed in British Columbia since uh, the failure itself uh, has had a wet closure design associated with it. So yep. things really haven't changed at all. It's pretty much business as usual in the regulatory and uh, in the industry circles. Let me talk a bit for a minute about dry closures and how those can be achieved. Uh, everyone has heard about dry tailings and in the upper right uh, you'll see a picture of the dry tailings facility uh, that's a bit dated now at the Green Street mine uh, in Alaska which is an interesting location because it's a very wet location and yet they are doing and a cold location most of the year. Uh, so that's a location where dry tailings uh, has been successful. Uh, the lower left uh, picture is also a picture at Greens Creek and you can see there the installation of a finger drain which is that ridge of uh, fairly large uh, rock size material um, extending out from us in the picture. So even with the dry tailings facility, you need to install some sort of drain and collect infiltration seepage into the material because if you don't, then it will resaturate. So that even with dry tailings, you've got some sort of treatment uh, of this seepage water. Um, another approach to dry closures, which is not often discussed, uh, certainly not uh, uh, in most of the literature I've seen, uh, would be the an impoundment with, which is wet during operation, but which has a drain system uh, underneath it. And in this particular picture, which is a, a design from the uh, Cherry Creek impoundment at Montanor, Montana, you can see those uh, green lines behind the tailings dam itself. Uh, that's the drain system under the impoundment. The uh, copper colored uh, lines are the main collection system. You can see it actually goes out under the dam and then into that seepage collection pond. So um, this type of system I think has a lot of promise. The disadvantage over dry tailings is that you can't compact them. So you can't get them to an optimal uh, density that would be say self-supporting and do away with the need for a dam or, or uh, also resisting saturation, resaturation to a maximum. But what it does for you is that if it if it dries those tailings out uh, and even leaves isolated areas that are saturated, if there is a failure of that impoundment in the future, um, those tailings aren't going to wash out of there like they did at Mount Polly. Uh, they'd probably go out for I don't know, I'm guessing, you know, 100 meters or so, but you wouldn't have millions of cubic yards of tailings rushing downstream. Um, 
And here is a picture from uh, a gold mine in Cambodia that actually shows uh, this, this design which has been implemented. Uh, you can very clearly see the, the finger drains that have been uh, laid down at this mine. So technologically, you know, this is, uh, this is something that uh, not only is achievable, but it's actually been accomplished in, in a number of locations. So, so what we need to think about, uh, I think, in the nonprofit and community sector is, um, would we tolerate permanent, perpetual water treatment for a facility like this? Um, because it, in the long term, it would make uh, the, the safety, the risk of a, the risks associated with a catastrophic failure a lot less. Um, you might have a failure, but it, it uh, probably would not threaten loss of life or property. Uh, you do face some risk with increased costs for perpetual water treatment, uh, but that's a financial consideration as much as anything else. And I think that's probably a, a more acceptable risk to face than the loss of life and, and destruction of, of property and the environment. Uh, and I, I think with a proper design, uh, like with dry tailings, you can minimize uh, the amount of seepage if you uh, design that, if you put that into your design from day one. So that's uh, that's pretty much what I'd like to talk about today and uh, I'd certainly welcome some questions. Again, the, the issue is sort of, you know, what is the risk of perpetual water treatment and uh, is it, is it worth tolerating that uh, um, in cases where it would do away with uh, the potential risks of a catastrophic failure uh, of a wet tailings impoundment? So thanks very much. Uh, I'd be pleased to take any questions. Hi, hi, Dave. Yes. This is, this is Stan Tamandel from Victoria, BC. What what would be some of the the conditions or the the structure of the construction that would be needed to be put in place, you know, to get go to have um, you know a good drainage system? Well, this picture shows pretty well what you'd need to do, Stan. Something like this. Um, all tailings dams already have a drainage system built into them. Um, in this particular slide, those large green lines that sort of uh, mirror the shape of the dam, uh, that's a system that's gonna go in regardless. That's already there today. And, and that the intent of that system is to drain the dam and the intent of the seepage collection dam is to collect seepage. And those are already things that are standard on on every every tailings dam. So the thing we're adding is this finger drain system behind the dam. Uh, and although it can be extensive, um, as is the case here, th this is not, you know, a major expense. This is not something that's gonna break the bank. Uh, Ruth from Kamloops, uh, British Columbia. Uh, we have a proposed mine, Ajax mine. I'm not sure whether you're aware of it. And yes, I uh, am. the tailings pond has gone from wet to dry to back to wet. <laughs> Above the city of 90,000 people, directly below uh, the creek that is going to become the tailings pond, five times as large as Mount Polly. And I believe they went from wet to dry to wet and back to wet again because of, it was too expensive. It, is there, I mean, is British Columbia aware of how the dry uh, tailings can work? And, and uh, if so, why, why aren't we getting assistance from the province? 
Well, I, I, Ruth, I think that gets uh, back to this issue of safety yeah. needs to be evaluated separately from economic considerations. And uh, I think what you're seeing, you know, clearly is cost driving uh, the consideration. Everything. <laughs> so the, the way I see this happening, it's not like uh, they're trying to design the absolute cheapest impoundment they can, but uh, but I think what ha what does happen is that a company goes to an engineering firm and says, I need you to design me a tailings facility and it can only cost X dollars or my project isn't economical. So. And any advice for us? Well, I, we've, we've been fighting this since 2011. Yeah. I mean, I would hope you would, you would, uh, cite the Mount Poly expert panel saying that safety needs to be the prime consideration. I'm part and, of the lawsuit. And, uh, you know, in the, in the case of a mine like Ajax, where that's above a community, there's definitely a risk of loss of life from a wet impoundment. So in your situation, I don't even think uh, an impoundment that's, that's wet and then drained would be appropriate uh it okay. needs to be dry from from day one just because um there with a wet impoundment even during operation there's a risk of a failure that could cause loss of life and uh um there's no need to, the only there's no need from a safety perspective to do that uh it as we've said it can be done with with dry tailings and that would mean the risk of loss of all loss of life would be eliminated. Hi Dave, this okay. is uh this is Nikki Skews from Smithers. I um I'm trying to wrap my head around uh the the quantity of water. I guess I'm not really visualizing that or seeing that like the difference between um like perpetual water treatment for the same quantity of water that would have been in a wet tailings facility or, you know, or maybe it's different in different cases, but um, just in terms of magnitude, I would appreciate that as well as a comment on um, dry tailings for acid rock drainage, the exposure to, to air and how um, the risks of that versus other, and if there's any other options. Mm -hmm. So, um... I think in terms of quantity, um, the only difference between wet tailings that are then dried out and dry tailings is that amount of water that's in the pond at mine closure, you know, which really isn't a major consideration. That's something that can be drained and uh, stabilized in a, in a relatively short time, I would say, you know, five to 10 years. Um, and then w with that type of uh, wet impoundment closure that's now dry and dry tailings, yeah. both, both are going to have seepage and y you've got to have the ability to treat uh, each one. So even dry tailings has seepage associated with it. Uh, as as does of course paste tailings, any type of tailings, and uh, typically with a with a dry tailings facility, they'll put a cover on it to minimize the seepage. But uh, y you still have to uh, collect and treat seepage, no matter what type of closure you have. It, it's just the amount we're talking about, and and uh, what I'm postulating is that with this draining a wet facility you, you you're really depending on what you know if you cover it or not basically uh you're you're really looking at the same sort of treatment volumes you are with dry tailings unfortunately thanks. dry tailings aren't really dry <laughs> okay thanks and then can you talk about the acid rock drainage issue so um there's probably more potential for acid rock drainage if you if you have a dry tailings situation because you now have air and some water um, and sulfide material. So 
the drainage that you're the seepage that you're going to get out of these impoundments, closed impoundments in the long term, uh, is going to have some metals and and other acid production products with it, sulfate and uh, uh, and neutral drainage type ions. Um, so you've just got to come up with a way to minimize the volume you have to treat and have you know an effective uh, hopefully passive treatment system to deal with that. The, the advantage of a wet closure is that you don't stop acid generation completely but you minimize it. Um, but what the Mount Polly panel asked, I think appropriately so, was is it risk the work, the loss of a catastrophic failure and and loss of life property and the environment? Is, you know, is it worth that risk to minimize asset production? And they quite clearly say no. Hi, David. Um, this is Kathleen Heideman from the Mining Action Group uh, up in Upper Michigan. And, and my question would be um, pertaining to that first recommendation, safety attributes should be evaluated separately from economic considerations. Cost should not be the determining factor. Um, in Michigan, at least, the, the tailings uh, impoundment, so I'm looking at, for example, um, a local mine, Eagle Mine, and their tailings um, impoundment is actually subaqueous tailings disposal in, a, in an old mine pit. And um, in this case, uh, the, the mine pit that's used for the subaqueous tailings uh, disposal permanently is permitted under our mining regulations as opposed to um, water regulations for, you know, like a NIPTES permit. So mm -hmm. I'm just curious how the safety attributes uh, can be evaluated separately because, you know, the mining permit is definitely something that the mining company is doing. Um, it doesn't have the same feasibility alternatives analysis that like a NIPTES permit would have. I think, you know, in the case of a, um a wet closure that does not involve uh, a potential dam failure, then that may be an appropriate way to go. You still have, even with a wet closure, you have the risk of groundwater contamination or uh, pit, pit, pit water overflow that to surface waters that has contaminated water. But um, But that's where I think you get into the individual site considerations. Um, where this gets a little tricky, uh, especially in Canada, but this is a situation that's equally applicable, unfortunately, in the United States, is, you, you know, the use of a lake for waste disposal. Um, but abandoned pit uh, um, would hopefully be ideal, but again, you have to do an individual uh, site assessment to see whether there are potential groundwater or surface water issues associated with that. Well, Dave, there's a number of questions that have come in through the chat that you might want to respond to. <laughs> yeah, so I see Lewis's question talking about being uncomfortable with the idea of perpetual water treatment and um, uh, deal, especially in light of something like the ferro mine complex uh, uh, and Lewis comparable to that would be the Red Dog Mine in Alaska which is going to have a huge uh, perpetual water treatment issue there because of 
uh, similarly a lot or even greater levels of sulfide um, at, at that ore body. But again, for me, it, it, you know, it's it's stepping back and saying, if if you're going to have to um, eliminate perpetual water treatment by using a constructed facility, a tailings dam, uh, is that worth worth the risk? Because there's no loss of life associated with perpetual water treatment and and a failure of perpetual water treatment. So so this again really has to do with uh, tailing storage facilities and and design of of tailings dams and uh, if you sort of read between the lines of the Mount Polly expert panels risk assessment, which is one of their uh, appendices, they, they basically say all, all dams are going to fail. They're all going to yep. fail. So the yep. only way to, to really ensure uh, long-term stability uh, of tailings is to dry them out. And uh, they also clearly say that uh, without stability, um, protection for acid drainage uh, really isn't worth it because if you lose that stability and those tailings uh, are, are flushed out as a part of a catastrophic event, then you're going to have acid drainage then. And uh, so your efforts to protect against acid drainage in the long term with a wet closure uh, has been foiled. And, and you've had the worst of worst of everything. You've had a catastrophic failure and you have acid drainage instead of just having acid drainage. So uh, again, that's uh, uh, Lewis, that's the, the reason I, I, I wanted to have this seminar is to, you know, raise this discussion. You know, it's not, uh, it's not, uh, I, I don't think the, the policy decision is clear. It certainly isn't easy. Um, so Amy, Amy Crook, I'm looking at yours. Uh, uh, increase of financial sh surety requirements to cover the cost of perpetual water treatment. Um, th that is actually factored in uh, to most closures that I'm seeing nowadays and most closures uh, uh, I think are approaching this realistically. Uh, uh, the, the thing I would ask to make standard is that um, regulatory agencies employ their own consulting firms to check those calculations. Uh, they they want a firm that does not have a financial interest uh, in a mine, an individual mining company, or even mining possibly in general to do those calculations. They want to be working for the, the regulator, for the public, basically, to, to make sure that the calculations are reasonable. Um, Problem being, of course, that even if they're reasonable, that doesn't mean that uh, something's going to happen to uh, make those calculations wrong, and that's the risk that we face. But again, that's a financial risk. It's, it's not a safety risk. Dave, this is um, Amy Blanchet. Um, I was just going to ask you. Quick question um, on this. I mean, it seems to me, and, but test me on this, please. Um, if, if you are a community with an existing mine, um, this sets up one set of issues because in a community with an existing mine um, might think, you know, may have been sort of schooled in the, we don't like long-term water treatment because it's expensive, it's handing down to multiple generations, the water treatment. But what you're saying is in fact, you know, especially if you have an existing mine, long-term water treatment may be the best option, maybe the best option for safety, maybe the best option for managing contaminants that come with acid mine drainage, et cetera. 
I'm wondering, so first of all, I want to know if you think that's true. I think that's the base of what you're saying is don't be necessarily completely anti long-term water treatment if you've got an existing mine, because that might be the safest, best way to deal with your future options. I'm wondering if you're a community looking at new mining, though, too. Um, you know, of course, you want safety. And it seems to me, of course, you're concerned with long-term water treatment. And, you know, in, in that kind of situation, what do you think about your trade-offs? Well, I think with a new mine, I would definitely go for safety, mm -hmm. uh, safety first, and and aggressively pursue dry closure. And and what I'm seeing today is that uh, neither regulators or industry are really taking that to heart. They're basically following the old model, which is let's do a wet closure uh, and minimize. Uh, long-term treatment because that's the cheapest thing to do but the cheapest thing to do may not be the safest thing to do so you really need to look at what the consequences uh, of a failure might be now if, if that mines out in the middle of nowhere and and uh, you're willing to let tailings uh, go <laughs> uh, miles and miles uh, you know Mount Polly had Quinell Lake and that stopped it uh, the failure in Brazil went uh, 400 miles and went all the way to the ocean. So that's, you know, not a insignificant event. Um, and that failure impacted, you know, thousands of people. Uh, uh, fortunately, only 19 were killed. And if you've seen any live footage of that failure, it's just amazing because there was no warning to the communities uh, from the mine about the failure. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, people's lives have been impacted 400 miles downstream. So I think the, you know, the recommendation about safety attributes is from the expert panel is valid. But again, you, you you have to look at at your situation. You know, maybe uh, as in the case uh, in Minnesota or Michigan, uh, putting these in an abandoned pit uh, might be the best solution. Um, I have, there's a question here from Judith. Uh, what type of water treatment are we looking at? Um, you know, that's going to depend primarily on the amount of seepage. Uh, you can treat some pretty nasty water with biologic treatment systems, but uh, the big disadvantage of a biologic treatment system is that it has very limited capacity. Uh, it, it's usually limited. Uh, you know, in terms of, of flow um, and also uh, by weather. So uh, you can't have a large, highly contaminated flow. You might be able to get away with a small, highly contaminated flow. Uh, you want to try to avoid active treatment just because of the costs involved. Um, active uh, water treatment is much more expensive than passive treatment. And if you, if you can get a closure that has a reasonable chance of treating water passively, then the, the economic risk to the community is also minimized. Uh, uh, so Andres is asking about um, cases where the public has agreed to pay for the treatment after the community leaves. Well, I, I don't really know of any case where that has happened. Uh, there are a number of cases where that I know of where companies have left and the public has had to pay for water treatment, but they certainly didn't agree to that up front. And uh, uh, the norm today is that, that a mine would be required to put enough money into some sort of trust fund so that when they left the site that it was nominally buttoned up in a stable fashion that there would be enough money in a trust fund to generate interest to pay for 
all subsequent water treatment. And <clears throat> I've actually done some of those calculations myself. And uh, uh, if you're wrong about uh, the amount of water treatment you're going to have to handle or uh, the amount of chemicals that you use to treat that or the uh, interest that you would get on this trust fund or the rate of inflation, things can go badly wrong. And that's that's why it's a very risky calculation. And, and uh, uh, there's even kind of, it's kind of funny when you think about it, but who holds these trust funds? You know, what sort of institution has been around long enough to uh, have a credible a t track record. Uh, most governments don't last. The Roman Empire went for about 500 years. Uh, uh, the Vatican's been around quite a long time, but you know most governments don't don't uh, achieve that sort of term success, and uh, and, and that raises a very serious issue. But uh, because we're leaving that um, liability for future generations. <clears throat> but again, the fundamental consideration I'm raising here is do you want to leave them uh, uh, a financial liability or a catastrophic loss liability? That's that's the issue we need to think of in terms of safety. Yeah. Um, uh, so Amy Crook has asked another question about uh, looking at the Gr uh, Gibraltar mine and extreme risk of, uh, you know, if a failure, the, the, the risk would be, the consequences would be very extreme. Um, can mines that use wet tailings disposal during operations be converted to dry storage? Well, ideally you'd have this finger drain system that I showed you, but that's not possible to do once they've started uh, to actually put tailings into an impoundment. Now, is it technically feasible to dry those things out? Yes, it's technically feasible. There, there, are, there are two ways that I know of to do it. You could uh, drill wells into the tailings uh, and, and basically pump water out, uh, or you could horizontally drill uh, like through the dam into the tailings and, and uh, uh, you know, construct an artificial, dr a, a, a post tailings drain system. Uh, both of those things would be very expensive. Uh, and I don't think it's likely that I'll ever see it done, but uh, technically, could it be done? Yes. But where would it go? Well, you'd have to treat it. Okay. So the stuff, the stuff that comes out, you'd have to treat. And but again, you're you're into this sort of long term, uh, trying to minimize the treatment volume scheme that that I already talked about. Great. Uh, Mary is asking a question about how paste tailings compare with dry stack or wet tailings in terms of uh, safety. Um, paste, paste tailings are still wet and um, they're not uh, so in comparison to dry tailings they probably have twice as much water. Uh, Instead of around 10% water, they'd be about 20. And uh, paste tailings are not compacted like dry tailings are. So uh, in a sense, paste tailings would be like wet tailings that are drained, except that uh, there's probably much more consistency in the moisture content. Uh, they, they do have uh, some... Um, self-stability. They still need to have some sort of retaining structure uh, associated with them. So uh, as you probably know, you know, it's intermediate between uh, wet tailings and dry tailings, but like wet and dry tailings, they're also going to have seepage over the long term that you, that you have to deal with. Uh, there just isn't any type of, of tailings disposal that's not going to have some sort of seepage to deal with. Uh, 
so Kathleen from the Mining Action Group is talking about uh, um, how you, you know, how is financial responsibility or how is that instrument calculated? And I, and I did just touch on that, you know, basically what you do is you say, what kind of a water facility are we going to have to build? Uh, what are the operational costs going to be? Uh, what are the capital uh, replacement costs going to be for that? Uh, and then uh, what sort of uh, rate of return are you going to get on an investment and what's the inflation rate going to be and you plug that all into a, a spreadsheet and you see how much money you have to put in the bank now to generate enough net interest every year to pay the operational and replacement costs for that treatment. Um, and, and that's that's how they're calculated, but again, it all comes down to the assumptions you make, and and uh, uh, it's a very sensitive um, calculation. Uh, mining companies, in particular, but even regulatory agencies, tend to be a little uh, optimistic about the uh, rate of return they can get on investments. Um, and and my caution to them is be very careful because uh, anything more than about a 3% uh, net return isn't really realistic and, and certainly to look at you know you know what you get on your uh, average uh, savings account in a bank today is about what 0.1% so uh, <laughs> uh, that's really not sustainable in terms of uh, uh, trust account maintenance over the long period. Lori uh, Anderson, I'm reading your question. Let me just read it. Consider a life after people situation where we assume that at some point there won't be a human society to deal with the impacts of mining. You know, what are the options, outcomes, and impacts when we can't count on money, people, and technology to address legacy mining issues? Um, I'm not sure. There, uh, there's no clear answer to that. Lori, I mean, I mean, that's what we all have to think about in the long run, um, and and I guess uh, you, you know what we what we have to do is is start with a consideration of you know is mining essential for maintaining a lifestyle uh, that we deem to be essential for society today, and uh, uh, society has pretty clearly said that it is. Uh, but then it, I think it becomes our obligation to try to, uh, as members of society, uh, that, that's made a, a group decision to try to minimize uh, the potential to impact future generations. Uh, we nominally leave them, um, leave future generations uh, uh, an investment, you know, in, in terms of, uh, well, if nothing else, you know, roads and dams and, and you know, power or whatever, but, but, but we want those uh, um, legacies to be positive and not negative, obviously. Um, Douglas Gook uh, wants to know, how you estimate and demand adequate bonds with temporary corporate entities. The, um, the financial surety calculations, both for closure and for post-closure, and I like to separate the two, uh, but typically they're done at the same time, but uh, uh, they need to reflect current technologies and current financial conditions. Uh, 
So it's up to the regulatory agency to make sure that it's got enough money to, to properly close a mine according to the reclamation plan um, if that mine were to go bankrupt today. And uh, so it needs to look at things like inflation and uh, increased um, disturb, disturbed areas. And it always needs to be in front of that, not behind th those considerations. And likewise, for post-closure treatment, it needs to evaluate on a very regular basis while the mine's in operation how much it needs for post-closure. And it can't depend upon uh, operations, for instance, uh, to fund that unless that operational funding can stay in front of those needs. So uh, typically what's done is uh, uh, a company will take out a very large financial surety for post-closure water treatment. In the case of the Red Dog Mine, it's approaching $550 million uh, for, for uh, post-closure water treatment. Um, and if the company were to go to bankrupt, then uh, those financial sureties would fund that trust fund immediately so that post-closure treatment could be paid for. So it's just incumbent upon uh, the regulatory agencies to make sure that their financial needs uh, are covered by uh, financial guarantees from the company. And, and that is done uh, in most cases in my experience. Um, Andres asks, can I recommend some books articles on this topic? Um, I don't know of anything um, that covers this this issue comprehensively. I, I, I'm just not aware of it. it it's um, I would describe it as an active issue. You know, it's something that uh, that I'm I, I am certainly trying to press regulatory agencies and and companies today to make safety paramount and to um, uh, consider dry closures seriously rather than superficially. Um, um, and in terms of, of financial sureties, uh, uh, you could probably do a Google search and come up with some inf some good information on financial sureties. That's an issue that we've been kicking around for a decade or so. So there, there probably is some just some articles that that are 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 good on that, but I can't recommend anything off the top of my head. Uh, um, okay, um, Kathleen is asking about uh, EPA's proposed financial responsibility requirements under Circle 108B. Um, quite frankly, I think uh, under this administration, we're going to see them dragging their feet as much as they can on this particular issue. Uh, um, there is a legal requirement, a court requirement for EPA to do this. Um, and they're taking comments, which are, I think, due uh, July 11th on this particular issue. I intend to comment on it. Bonnie Gestering of Earthworks is is heading up commenting on this, uh, and, and I expect she will probably have some sort of sign on, uh, but I'm not really very optimistic about what the Trump administration will do with it. Um, if they do something, hopefully they'll do something so bad that the court won't accept it. But uh, uh, um, this may be an issue that isn't settled for years. Dave, this is um, Amy again, and I wonder, you might not have an answer to this yet, because I don't know if anybody has seen it yet. Um, I know I haven't, but I know that the Mining Association of Canada is going to come out with their new 
recommendations in their towards sustainable mining program based on the Mount Polly panel and um, you know can we have some optimism that they will seek to I know a few of these questions have been you know how can we change regulatory and um, policy legal expectations based on this on the Mount Polly panel and it seems to me you know the industry itself may all be pivoting somewhat to be responsive to this. Do you have any optimism about that? Unfortunately, I'm not very optimistic about what Mining Association of Canada is going to come out with. Um, industry, uh, to a great extent, and the regulators, to a slightly less extent, are, are, are putting all of their eggs in the basket of these independent review panels. So uh, a major tailings dam will have to have an independent review panel associated with it. This independent review panel is supposed to tell it like it is and, and uh, avoid situations like Mount Pauly where um, the uh, engineering company in charge uh, convinced itself that the dam was safe when it really wasn't. Um, unfortunately, I'm, I'm not optimistic that independent review panels are going to be sufficient to solve this problem. Um, and there's two reasons for that. One is that uh, MAC and industry are of the, are of the opinion that uh, any recommendations from these panels should be private communications between the uh, panel and the mining company. And I think that transparency is essential in that sort of communication in that uh, uh, especially if and perhaps even limited to which would be okay for me but but if the panel recommends something to the company and the company says no we don't think that's necessary then I think everybody ought to know about that uh, and at that point you know it it needs to be publicly scrutinized if the company is uh, uh, implementing every recommendation of the panel, uh, okay, that's fine. I, I don't know that I need to pay attention to that. But if they don't, I think that that raises a big red flag for me. And that's not the way things are headed right now, uh, either regulatorily or, or in the industry. And, and the other reason is uh, independent technical review panels are not new. Uh, there was an independent technical review panel for Fundao, and it failed. So, uh, so obviously, the sort of uh, having more of the same isn't going to cure the problem. Um, Amy uh, Crook has asked about how we might implement some of these uh, proactive best what I would call best practices and um, uh, she points out that uh, there's probably going to be a new government in BC that will be more favorable to this uh, and, and you know how could we do this uh, to me the the best instrument that I see out there is associated with the, what's what's being called the transboundary mining issue um, and it arose because of uh, mines in British Columbia being proposed for watersheds that, that uh, end up in Alaska. Uh, there are also, by the way, mines in British Columbia uh, that have discharges into waters that come into Montana. And uh, uh, the province to state direct relationship is the one that the government's uh, previous uh, past and present governments have touted uh, and it hasn't worked with Montana and we don't think it wor will work in Alaska primarily for two reasons. Uh, one, there's no mandatory financial coverage for catastrophic events. Uh, so if a mine fails in Canada, uh, like the Mount Pauly mine and like what happened in BC, there's no catastrophic coverage that, that clicks in. Uh, however, if you're an oil pipeline company, you have to have that catastrophic coverage in BC. And if you're a major oil tanker shipper, 
and you come in and out of BC, you have to have that sort of catastrophic coverage. So, you know, one question would be, why does BC require this for one industry and not another? Is that equitable? Uh, and, and it certainly isn't equitable to those who stand to lose from uh, being impacted by that sort of event. So uh, catastrophic coverage is, is one issue. Another issue is best practices. And, and, and I think in the transboundary sense, uh, is it reasonable for people in Alaska to say, uh, we expect mines in British Columbia that have waters that, that end up in the United States and face existing or potential contamination? Is it, is it appropriate for them to use, to be required to use best practices? And I think that's very appropriate. So yeah. the transboundary effort is what it's trying to do is trying to get the International Joint Commission involved. The IJC is an out, it, it, it was an outgrowth of uh, uh, the 1907, I may have the year wrong, uh, Boundary Waters Treaty Act. So uh, it was, it, it's designed to address exactly this kind of issue at a nation to nation level. And it has to be nation to nation in order to be legally binding because it's an international agreement. So. I think the transboundary effort is headed down the right path and we just need to have people on both sides of the border, you know, in BC, in Montana, in Idaho, in Washington, in Alaska, uh, pressing their federal representatives to invoke this uh, commission to address this problem because that's exactly what it was designed for. Uh, to address these kind of issues. And that's the only way we're going to really get a solution. Uh, and oh, by the way, uh, if we get a solution, you know, between BC and Alaska, BC, Montana, whatever, uh, th that becomes, f f for catastrophic coverage, you know, that becomes a, uh, an example to use elsewhere. And, uh, uh, you know, what what are the sorts of best practices that we might want to see employed? Uh, and that's where the work that Amy Boulanger and, and Irma uh, are doing right now, trying to uh, come up with a multilateral uh, approved uh, set of best practices. So uh, I think the transboundary is really uh, uh, a very key issue and, and and might help us move, take significant steps forward on a number of issues. We're over time, uh, Mary. Um, uh, Amy's organization, uh, the Fair Mining Collaborative, has put out a path to zero failures. Uh, so that's a resource to use. Carla Marshall raises the question about an EPA exempting uh, uh, mining companies from the Safe Drinking Water Act. Uh, yes, I mean, that's not really tied you know to what we're talking about today too closely but um, um, EPA's only uh, control over groundwater is related to drinking water uh, uh, most of the uh, and I agree Carla it's not appropriate uh, but most of the regulation for groundwater is actually done at a state level these days, so that's one alternative. Maybe you can get the state involved uh, in, in a positive way, but uh, EPA is certainly not gonna be helpful under the Trump administration. So Mary, I think we should probably close it off. Um, okay, this is mean excellent. Thank you so much, Dave, for, for taking the time today. Um, very much appreciated. And, and Ruth from Kamloops, 
Thank you, David. You've uh, given me a couple of things that uh, I'm going to go to city council meeting with today. Well, again, it's something to think about. Uh, it certainly um, caused me uh, to uh, spend a lot of time scratching my chin and thinking about it uh, because I certainly understand why people should be concerned about perpetual water treatment. But uh, uh, what Mount Polly and what the panel did for me was really sort of bring the, the safety issue home to roost. Great. Thank you. Yes, thank thanks you. again, Dave, okay. and, and everyone who participated today. Yes, thanks for taking the time to listen. Bye-bye. Right. Hey.